like that for the nuclear. And uh, also, you know, the title of each one together with separate pictures. read a little bit about every one. And so we have John Lynn here. He is the principal consultant with Zephyr Nuclear. Has 48 years of nuclear power experience. Has a broad range of experience in engineering, training, and operations disciplines. Uh, his recent work focuses on advanced reactor applications of Gothic, and uh, actually there is a Gothic workshop sponsored by the International Atomic Energy Agency for two weeks here in uh, our department. So this is the first week, and we still have the second week, and so of course he is providing all of the training. And of course, you know, he's working through the sodium cold designs, uh, he is the lead, you know, on the training, and the prior to joining exactly, uh, he worked as safety technical advisor and the safety analyst uh, at the TMI1, and as a containment and the safety analysis for Ariba, which he changes the name again back to Framato. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a U.S. Navy nuclear engineering officer, serving on two nuclear power cruisers. He also has experience in model development, analysis, and review in various firm and hydraulics codes. Uh, many of you may be using Relapse, uh, Reframe, Gothic, you know, content or that. And uh, the, you know, joint person with us is Rodney Margo, and he is here, and he is senior consultant also in the Like years of you. Thank you, Mohammed. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, I, I should have come in typical Halloween garb, given that it's October 31st. I did see on my way in this morning some students out there with uh, in costume. I'm kind of surprised they didn't see. There isn't in costume, but uh, anyway, welcome. Uh, Rodney and I are going to talk about uh, some Gothic applications in benchmarking. Uh, experimental reactors that were built uh, in the national laboratories using alternate fluids. Most of the analyses that are done today for operating plants is with light water. Um, light water in the U.S. in both pressurized water reactors as well as boiling water reactors. Canada has heavy water, but a lot of the advanced reactor designs, if you look at them, they're uh, sodium or a molten salt with uh, a classical pin fuel or a molten salt with uh, triso fuel uh, particles, uh, even a molten salt fuel. Uh, uh, we've been in the process of benchmarking our computer code Gothic to evaluate the performance of Gothic to be able to predict the behavior of the experiments. Uh, the two we're going to talk about today is the um, liquid sodium analysis, which was the uh, experimental breeder. We're going to talk about the molten salt reactor. Uh, if you're not familiar with Gothic, uh, Gothic is a um, uh, multi-physics computer code with uh, multi-dimensional capabilities to evaluate thermal hydraulic response. Uh, of, of whatever you analyze. Climate response, reactor coolant system, artillery uh, buildings, reactor buildings, uh, any application that you can think of for um, thermal hydraulic response. 
Um, it's a hybrid tool that can bridge the gap between uh, classical thermohydraulic codes and CFD. It is CFD-like. It is not CFD code. Um, it analyzes uh, with a larger grid to perform the same types of uh, evaluations that a CFD code can do, but with, with larger nodes and be able to run much faster to give results um, compared to a CFD code. Um, uh, it's got an established pedigree in the industry. It's widely used by uh, vendors, Westinghouse, um, Arriva Framatome now, uh, uh, General Electric. Uh, it's also used in the industry by the various utilities to analyze their own specific plant needs. Uh, it also has a wide usage uh, outside of the U.S. Um, in countries outside the U.S., China, this IAEA uh, fellowship that we have going on now, uh, Japan, Spain, uh, Germany, et cetera, um, are using it. Um, uh, it falls under the uh, NQA uh, qualification programs. It's qualified to uh, the NRC regulations as well as the AFA. Um, so it has a good pedigree. Um, the simulation that's shown up here is just an example of a of a putting together some control volumes. The upper right is a lump parameter volume, meaning it has one solution point. Uh, the center one with the um, arrows is a subdivided volume. The arrows represent the velocity vectors. The colors represent the, the temperatures. So in this case, you have a steam release into a, a, a volume, and you see the distribution of the steam from uh, the header, um, which then mixes in uh, with the other systems that have a pump and a heat exchanger, et cetera. So uh, in addition to being multiphasic and also has equipment modeling capabilities, pumps and valves and heat exchangers, et cetera. So a very broad and useful tool that could be used for most analysis purposes. The pedigree, it started based from the PNNL COBRA series of computer codes. Um, the nuclear engineering department here is familiar with COBRA. COBRA TF, CTF, uh, you may have heard, uh, is the predecessor for what ultimately became Gothic. Um, um, here, whoop, here out of the COBRA NC non-condensable gas was Fathom's code. The Fathom's code was developed by numerical applications out of Washington uh, State. Um, uh, that company is now owned by Zachary Nuclear uh, Engineering. Uh, became Gothic in 1989 uh, when it uh, went under quality insurance and um, uh, supported by the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI. Um, uh, to do steady and transient compressible flow, multidimensional flow, this upper right-hand example show was uh, we used Gothic to analyze a um, uh, scenario where there was a um, uh, carbon dioxide or carbon carbon dioxide release was used for fire fire uh, prevention in the cable rooms outside the control room. So this is a control room model showing a multi-dimensional array with blockages to block out the physical structures where there is no flow and the gas was released uh, both an odorant with the operator would smell did it meet the threshold before the concentration reached a point at which the operators would pass out because there wasn't sufficient oxygen. Um, uh, it has uh, second order uh, advection schemes uh, so a number of different solution schemes for the analysis, um, et cetera. Um, allows for natural circulation, mixing, buoyancy, stratification, uh, vapors and liquids, et cetera, which is important for most of the modern designs. All the operating reactors in the U.S. anyway all have forced circulation during normal power operation. They all have forced circulation for post-accident scenarios. However, all the advanced reactors, the Gen 4s, uh, the advanced reactors, small reactors are all passive cooling, uh, particularly post-accident. Okay? So it's important that a computer code can be able to model buoyancy-driven flows as an example to be able to remove the heat from the core 
uh, and reject it to the ultimate heat sink. Here's the video from, from this. The yellow and red are the uh, carbon dioxide concentration and the blue is the um, concentration of the odorant. Um, and you can see it uh, dispersing throughout the control room as a result of the release. Okay. Um, for uh, non-light water reactor response, uh, Gothic was modified in the last couple of years to change from correlation-based uh, steam and water properties to table-based properties. It still has the, the equation-based properties in it, but being able to do table-based properties, you no longer are limited to only water. And as a result of those changes, we've developed six molten salts. Those molten salts are available from EPRI when you get the code. Uh, we've also developed sodium and sodium potassium, also known as NAC, uh, to be used. That's the experimental breeder reactor. And NAC. Uh, we've also recently developed lead and lead bismuth um, uh, eutectic uh, to be able to use for fast reactors. Okay. Um, Gothic has a point kinetics model. It also has tracer capabilities. Somewhat simple manner, not the fully complex manner that you would but you can evacuate the response to changes in temperatures feedback. The tracers allow you to, to monitor for transport of various isotopes throughout the model. Uh, and right in, um, in talking about his benchmark of the MSRE. Um, Gothic also has the ability to, um, to be expanded. of Gothic to, to replace or enhance the heat transfer coefficients, the um, uh, friction factors. Uh, we've recent applications are um, for a customer that shall be named, uh, shall be remain nameless that's in Seattle um, uh, that's working on a traveling wave reactor uh, has wire wrapped uh, fuel rods. Uh, sure you know who I mean. Uh, TerraPower. Um, uh, uh, so this is this was a wire wrapped fuel pin in a in a sodium cooled reactor. Okay, so uh, in addition to having the fluid properties, you can also expand by adding the thermal hydraulic types of scenarios. Um, uh, in addition to ensure that the fluid properties were appropriate. Uh, especially for a lot of the scenarios that are run in a buoyancy driven flows with transient response, uh, need to be able to predict the speed of sound within the fluid appropriately. So uh, an example for that is to take um, basically a subdivided pipe and apply uh, a pressure response from one end and the pressure wave will go from one end to the other and back uh, through the fluid and the to occur from one end to the other is calculated and a speed of sound is determined and compared against uh, predicted or available data for the type of fluid. And here are two examples of that. The one on the left is water response and the one on the right is sodium response. And so you can see that it's quite a bit different in the, thermal, in the mechanical response of the fluid as a result of the pressure change, okay? And the speed of sound is much higher in sodium than it is in water, and so the response is going to be quite different, okay? And so the pressure response was predicted accurately, and the speed of sound was calculated accurately in both of these cases. And we've gone and done that for all of the fluids that we've developed. Um, in this, ex here is an example of that scenario for showing water and sodium and sodium potassium, also called NAC, as well as one of the salts. And you can see that the pressure response is much quicker in, in the sodium than it is in water. And um, the salt is similar to, to water, but they're, they're all different. 
Okay. Now we'll talk about uh, Mark that we're going to talk about today is experimental breeder reactor number two. It was built in Idaho National Laboratories out in the you know desert somewhere um, uh, uh, by uh, Los Al no by who was it I have it here uh, Argon sorry uh, built at Idaho went operational in 1964. Uh, how many people were born? Uh, before 1964. <laughs> uh, a um, uh, first criticality was in 65, testing began in 69. Uh, they ran a series of shutdown heat removal tests called SHRT or SHIRT um, in 1986. And we're going to, it's the benchmarks of those tests that we're going to talk about. And it was decommissioned in 1994. Okay. Government decided to stop spending money on it. Uh, everybody was in light water reactors, um, and and so the money went elsewhere. Um, the the noted behavior of the plant that was was important was that it demonstrated uh, that it had a self cooling capability even with the reactor at power. And the plant will self the result of natural circulation with no pumps running. Okay. That was the purpose of the tests, um, which is very good because that's what ultimately want, we want to have be the behavior for the small modular reactors and the advanced reactors that are being designed today and will continue to be designed in the future. It's also a prototype for the integral fast reactor, which was planned at the time. Um, the design was, was mostly completed and it was about ready to start construction when, again, the government decided, well, we're more light water reactor and we're thermal, uh, thermal reactors and so we're not going to continue on with the experiments of the, the fast reactor. So this is the reactor here. Uh, it was fairly small. The core was only a meter and a half tall. Uh, but, but it had a fair number of assemblies in it. Uh, 300 and I can't remember. Too many, not enough. It was a pool reactor, okay? So the core was in like a can. It sat down in, the, down in this pool of sodium. There was a pump that, two pumps that took sodium out of the pool, put it into the core, okay? And we went from the outlet of the core to a heat exchanger uh, into the pool. So the sodium loop operated in forced circulation. And in addition, there was an electromagnetic pump. Excuse me, slowed myself down. There was an electromagnetic pump in the, in the piping that goes from the core outlet to the heat exchanger. Okay, so you had as well as an electromagnetic pump. And the idea was that the electromagnetic pump might be needed if we lost power to the the, the, the centrifugal pumps, and therefore by having a back provide flow of sodium through the core, uh, uh, and therefore uh, anyway, okay. Um, the, ultimately, the heat was rejected to uh, to another sodium loop. Uh, intermediate loop, and then ultimately to um, um, uh, a secondary system and rejected steam. They had a, a sodium to water steam generators to produce steam, had a turbine, produced electricity. EBR1, the first experimental reactor, all it produced was power hanging in the control room. Produced electricity which is unlike most experimental reactors. Most experimental reactors, they just reject the heat to the environment. If you look at the ITER, the, the International Tokamak Experimental Reactor that's building, being built in Cataract, France, that's going to reject all of its heat to the environment. Okay? Typical of experimental reactors because they go up and down, you replace fuel with all kinds of different combinations, and reliably to provide some customer. Okay. Uh, and then if um, 
all of that was lost. There was a, a, a final loop, a passive decay heat removal loop that rejected heat to the environment through, um, through heat exchangers that are in the pool and ultimately through radiators. And Rodney will talk about the radiators a little bit on SRE. Similar type of configuration. Um, uh, this is what the plant looks like. So you had the sodium cool reactor, it produced steam. Their steam generators were separated. Uh, in a modern nuclear power plant, the steam generators are combined. So in a Westinghouse steam generator, um, the, the boiling region and the separation region and the drying region are all at EBR2, these were all separate, okay? And in addition to having, in addition to having an, uh, excuse me, uh, an evaporator and a steam drum, they also had a superheater. So they were actually able to produce superheated steam, uh, which is not typical for a light water reactor. Okay. Um, so then they could they could they could produce then um, electricity in a in a uh, turbine. Uh, for the um, for the shutdown heat removal tests that they ran, they ran two tests. Well, they ran more than two, but these are the two of which they have data that's available for benchmarking. Uh, SHRT-17 is a loss of flow event, um, protected, meaning the reactor was scrammed, and an unprotected event uh, with a loss of flow, meaning the reactor remained online. Okay? And effectively, it shut itself down because of um, reactivity. Um, the intent was to demonstrate the effective of effectiveness of natural circulation and reactivity feedback effects. Okay, so um, the circulation path is from the reactor through what's called the outlet pipe or the Z pipe because it's actually shaped like a Z, um, um, augmented by this auxiliary pump which is electromagnetic, uh, into the intermediate heat exchangers and rejects heat to the secondary loop, okay? The secondary loop comes in here and goes back out. Um, the flow goes into the pool, and then from the pool, the two, two centrifugal pumps pull sodium and inject it into the reactor. Uh, there's two loops, there's two, there's a, a low pressure piping system and a high pressure piping system um, that the flow could be adjusted by, uh, um, sorry, the, uh, there's a throttle valve here with a handle that sticks up to the operating deck. Um, real advanced capability uh, back in 1965. Um, uh, okay, and then there's a shutdown cooling system with a heat exchanger that uh, rejects heat to a uh, shutdown cooler, which is really just a, uh, an air stack with damper on it uh, for natural circulation to the to atmosphere. Um, so a Gothic model was developed of the reactor um, mod, the primary model. It was driven on the intermediate heat exchanger side by uh, boundary conditions, a forced flow and a pressure boundary condition. The core was a four channel core with uh, the active fuel, the driver assemblies, which produced the majority of the heat, um, uh, a channel for the control and safety rods, uh, this reactor does not use silver indium cadmium control rods. They do not use a boron carbide control rod. They use fueled rods, okay? So to shut down the reactor, the fueled rods were pulled out of the core, okay? To, to add reactivity, the rods are put into the core, okay? To add more fuel into the, into the core. Um, oops. The third channel was the inner reflector, uh, and the inner reflector is mostly stainless steel and uh, an outer blanket, which are mostly spent assemblies, okay? Low power, not much reactivity left to it, but still has some residual decay heat, okay? Um, and so, keep flipping the channel. So we have a pump. Uh, control volumes modeling the piping, control volumes modeling the inlet and outlet plenums, uh, the Z-pipe, um, 
uh, a configuration to simulate the electromagnetic pump um, and control volumes with thermal conductors to model the heat exchangers uh, to transfer the heat. Okay? And it all sits in a pool of, of sodium. Uh, the, so as I said, this model was driven by boundary conditions on the secondary side. The, there was a benchmark specification provided by um, ANL uh, to uh, others that wanted to simulate the, the, the bound, to simulate the transients and the boundary condition information was available when we used that. It allowed us to keep the model small and simple and be able to run the test. We also have additional models that have additional detail in them, um, uh, much higher detail in the core region, much higher detail in the, in the, um, in the pool region, more multidimensional than we used for this simple uh, benchmark. Uh, we've also modeled all the way out, uh, including the intermediate heat exchanger system, steam system, including the steam generators, uh, which now is water and sodium. Um, uh, and finally, we have a model that has the shutdown cooling system rejecting heat to the environment through the air stack. I talked about the four core assemblies. The heat is added to the core through thermal conductors. The thermal conductors are configured as fuel pins with all the surface area that's needed to produce all of the volume and the, and the right surface area between the fuel and the, and the coolant channels. And the heat is added internal to those fuel pins uh, as a so we're a more evaluation of the fuel pins because we needed to know what the fuel pin temperatures were in terms of the clad temperature and the uh, the fuel temperature because those were important for the reactivity feedback mechanism uh, the reactor the reactivity addition to the core model uh, kinetics were developed using uh, control systems gothic does not have a, a neutron kinetics model and so we developed it in the control system capability to provide that capability as well it's like building a bunch of equations together um, uh, it includes all of the feedback mechanisms that um, are important for this reactor doppler uh, expansion of the clad the core uh, the reflectors um, as well as the fuel expansion. Uh, it includes the ability to provide reactivity uh, control through the control rods to control power. Uh, the user can provide transients for reactivity addition if you wanted to do a reactivity type transient. Uh, reactor scram, uh, the kinetics model, put my finger over the laser, that's not smart. Uh, and then the heat is added to the thermal conductors. Uh, the steady state uh, predictions, uh, the steady state conditions for the two that were evaluated, shirt 17 and shirt 45, had different initial conditions uh, before the tests were run. Uh, the benchmark was uh, excellent against those conditions. And the test was run. Shirt 17, again, I said is a protected loss of uh, flow event. You have the primary pumps are tripped and the electromagnetic pump is tripped. So now you have no, first, no forced flow. The only way to remove heat from the core is through natural convection, buoyancy-driven flows between the hot core and the cold pool, okay? So the reactor is scrammed and um, uh, there's passive decay heat removal, no active means. The, uh, the experiment demonstrates natural circulation cooling, reactivity feedback, and the inherent safety features of this type of a reactor. Okay. The transient was run by a trip of the number two pump and the number one pump and the EM pump. And this shows the flow as a function of time uh, in that pump uh, compared against the experimental data and the results uh, compared very well. Uh, the other parameters evaluated were um, total, I'll start with total power, total power uh, compared excellent, which indicates that uh, the point kinetics model with the reactivity feedback, which was mostly insignificant by then, 
because there was a large uh, insertion of negative reactivity from the control rod, the scram rods. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems with the data from the shirt test um, was they're not sure where the temperature probe was uh, in the outlet plenum above the core for the core outlet. There was a lot of structure in there uh, and the flow pattern was not well, well understood and well documented and therefore the ability to benchmark that was not very good by anybody including the lab using their code SAS or SASs. Okay. And with that it benchmarked closer to a core average temperature. If this is the shirt result, um, this is what Gothic predicted for a core average outlet. Okay, so their sensor was more representative of an average rather than an absolute high or an absolute low. Okay, everybody could have done better potentially if we knew where the probe was and had notalize the core outlet to more detail. But this is what you'll find with experimental data from test facilities, is not all the parameters are going to be uh, uh, real, okay? There's sensor lag. Uh, the sensor is it's not in exactly the location. Uh, it isn't responding. There's, in the next test, one of the sensors didn't respond for a significant portion of Makes mark. Um, the next test was the uh, SHRT 45R, the unprotected loss of flow. Uh, it was a trip of the primary pumps, but the electromagnetic pump continued to operate. Okay. Um, the reactor was not scrammed. Uh, again, there was passive decay heat removal uh, and demonstrates reactivity feedback and the inherent feature. On. Um, uh, this is the again the same number two pump of the of the uh, of the centrifugal pumps in the in the pool, and the benchmark of the flow is is also very good um, uh, from Gothic. The total power prediction is also very good, and the total reactivity is is also uh, pretty good. Meaning that our prediction of the reactivity from the measurement of the fuel response was was appropriate. Okay, um, so Gothic compared very well for shirt 17 and shirt 45 uh, for primary flow, high and low pressure flow in the uh, pump number two. Um, the core outlet Z pipe inlet temperatures were good, not perfect. Again, but there were issues with the experimental data and the reactor, reactor power and the reactivity feedback were also very good. And now I'll turn it over to Rodney to talk about the molten salt experimental reactor. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Rodney Harville, and I'm going to be talking about the molten salt reactor experiment benchmarking that I did with Gothic. Okay, oh. first of all, um, I will talk about what the molten salt reactor experiment was. This was a, uh, a reactor design that was uh, built and, de and demonstrated at Oak Ridge National Lab in the 60s. Um, it was a proof of concept liquid fuel reactor, graphite moderated and designed for, use, designed for thermal neutrons. Um, you had uh, uranium fluoride fuel. It was dissolved in uh, liquid phase fluoride salt. And now what does that mean? It's dissolved in the liquid phase fluoride salt. That actually means that the fuel is in the coolant. Unlike the EBR2, unlike your light water reactors like Harris just, uh, just down the road from us, 
those have the fuel in the core and the core only. It better stay in the core. Um, in this case, the fuel is actually in the coolant. It is circulating through the coolant loop. And it is in a critical configuration only in the core. Courtesy of the graphite uh, moderator that is located there. So in this particular setup, you have the, you have the reactor vessel. You have a pump that circulates the, uh, the fuel and coolant. A heat exchanger that transfers the heat from the fuel salt loop to the coolant salt loop. You also have a coolant salt loop. It's just a second, it's a secondary loop. Um, basically ensures that if there is a leak in this heat exchanger, you don't get direct, trans, 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 direct transfer of uh, radionuclides to the environment. As John said, a lot of uh, experimental reactors exhaust their heat to the environment. That is the case here. So you have an air-cooled radiator. Um, oh, good. I'm sure that uh, some of you might be surprised to think in terms of an aircraft reactor program. 1950s. The concern was deterrent. Uh, nuclear weapons deterrent with the Soviets. They wanted to be able to get a, uh, get a bomb in quickly. So they thought, well, what if we have a nuclear-powered air airplane that flies for a month at a time carrying a bomb in its bomb bay? Well, um, in parallel, they were also designing ICBMs, and that's what they ultimately went with. But they actually designed and built an aircraft reactor, not tested in the air, but tested in a facility at Oak Ridge. In fact, the molten salt reactor experiment was built in the same building as the decommissioned uh, aircraft reactor. Um, it ran from June 65 to March of 68, and it was using uranium-235. From October of 68 to May of 69, it was using uranium-233. Had they uh, gotten to a next phase, which they really wanted, I don't know if they would have used the molten salt reactor experiment, but they would have wanted. At least that was the plan. They did get the funding, and uh, that was the end of this uh, experiment. There are some uh, technical issues associated with the fuel. First of all, the uh, fuel that is in plates, rods, etc., or even uh, pellets, it's all mechanical. But this is very different. You're dealing with a chemical engineering problem of uh, dissolving your fuel. How do you uh, add the fuel? How do you remove it? Um, how do you deal with your fission products? Is there a way to get your fission products out of the coolant? It's all chemical engineering. Some advantages of the molten salt. First of all, island. Well, you don't have to worry about that. Fuel's already melted. Fuel. What do you do? There's also more fuel. And you can also do online fission product removal. Uh, there are ways to do it chemically, and uh, some of your fission products. Uh, think xenon 135, big uh, neutron poison. Well. Um, it's a gas, so you can off-gas it. In fact, that's, ex that's exactly what they did with the molten salt reactor experiment. They had a little um, fitting in the uh, fuel salt pump to try to get that xenon uh, into the uh, vapor phase and then off into, it, off, into the uh, off-gas system. Um, also, molten salt has a really, really high boiling point. So unlike a light water reactor, you don't have to have it under a lot of pressure. In fact, this thing ran at about five pounds of overpressure. Um, of course, there are some disadvantages as well. First of all, your fuel's in the loop. Your fission products are in the loop, which means that um, unless you have a death wish, you're not going to go into, your, uh, into the area of the loop. The radiation levels are just going to be too high. You're going to have to use remote maintenance. Um, 
Also, the salts are very corrosive, so you have a big materials issue with trying to make sure that uh, your uh, metal out of which it's built uh, will survive. And, and they did study that with their Hastelloy in that they used. So, before they uh, built the molten salt reactor, they actually built a fifth scale model and a full scale model, which uh, were used for hydraulic testing with water, not molten salt, but with water. So, um, what they wanted to be able to do was to, well, actually, what happened was they, they demonstrated, interestingly enough, a radial velocity distribution on account of uh, geometric factors. The graphite sitting on a support lattice and that flow channels. ones had different um, average. And that actually is going to, that's actually, and, and just hold that thought. That's actually going to matter, believe it or not. Um, yeah, there were five radial core regions with these different average velocities. And then there was a full-scale model, which built and used to test uh, for different, the appropriate differential pressures across the core and across the vessel, and get a little better idea of the uh, uh, internal flow patterns. Now, this is my model that I built of the, uh, the full-scale model. So I wanted to capture an important phenomena but also have some efficient run times. It's one of the, one of the, one of the issues with uh, running a computer model. Cells are too small, your current limits are going to go too small, or um, too many cells, and that's going to drag out your run time. So what I did is I did a multi-channel representation of the core there. So I had, uh, while there were five radial zones, what I did is I did four channels. I merged the two outer zones. Um, there's also a uh, downcomer that, that for, uh, you have, what, what you have is water goes into an inlet volute that wraps around, wraps around the vessel. Huh? Salt. In this case, this is the, this is the, uh, oh, this was the, the tip. yeah, this was, this is, this is the full scale model. So it goes down into a downcomer, then into, um, the lower plenum into the core inlet area, which is, where that, which is where that structure is, then through the flow channels through the, gra through the uh, graphite, and they did use graphite in, the, in there, and then an outlet plenum, and then finally an outlet pipe. Um, where am I? I modeled the downcomer and the, uh, and the core as 1D, but always uh, add more detail at a cost in runtime. was the flow rate. And uh, one other thing is I actually tuned the loss coefficients. Oops. Did I just turn it off? Yeah. Uh, loss coefficients in these flow paths to actually get And here are the results. As you can see, I matched the uh, inlet pipe. I, ma I didn't match the flow at the bottom of the downcomer, and that's because there's uh, the holes from the inlet volute into the uh, downcomer are at a 30 degree angle producing a swirl pattern. So uh, that five and a half uh, feet per second represents the swirl velocity as opposed to the downward velocity. My model only gets the downward. Um, and as you can see, my uh, core region uh, velocities are just about on the money as is my uh, core delta P and my vessel delta P. Now for the actual benchmark. What I did is I took my uh, full scale model and then uh, expanded it by adding in the uh, fuel salt loop, the pump, heat exchanger, the piping, coolant salt loop. That includes the uh, radiator. I'm sorry, the radiator right there. Basically, the radiator is a uh, gothic fan cooler. Some of, you, some of you may have. So normally a fan cooler, the air is going from the air to the case. 
the heat is going the other way. I did use volumetric pumps for the, uh, for the pump side. Decided not to go with uh, head flow pumps, but just went with uh, straight volumetric with a specified flow. Um, I used uh, lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride uh, properties for the fuel salt and the coolant salt loops. Um, it's probable that there's some delta in garlic and the, and the properties that were actually in the uh, molten salt reactor. Different, uh, different uh, ratios, potentially different ratios of uh, lithium fluoride and beryllium fluoride as well as uh, the fact that the molten salt reactor fuel salt loop actually had the uranium fluoride dissolved in it, which you know is going to affect some of the properties. In this particular case, in the is modeled exclusively. And I'm depositing um, fission heat both into the fuel salt and into the graphite. They had about six to seven percent of the heat um, ending up in the graphite, so I just uh, distributed that amount of heat into the graphite um, using internal heat generation rates. I also modeled decay heat precursors. Seven percent of the power was modeled as decay heat, and I used the uh, 11 decay heat precursor groups from AS. Um, this is basically just a simple decay heat correlation. Um, I initialized the precursor group concentrations based on matching the uh, decay heat uh, to the uh, generation rate of the power, and uh, they were and the precursors were added in proportion to the power level. So if or addition rate's also going to go down. But that does allow me to put decay heat into the core. All right. So I ran six steady state cases. One at uh, the design power of 10 megawatts. As you can see, I'm actually quite close on... Uh, the, the, the uh, system temperatures. The differences between these, uh, these different cases, one of them I ran with absolutely no decay heat. They designed, all the design reports assume no decay heat. The, this, the, remember, this, this unit was built in the 60s. All those ANS um, decay heat. Um, then I modeled with decay heat, and then I did another decay heat case where I adjusted the heat exchanger heat transfer coefficient to push the uh, reactor vessel out with design value. So, so basically, what's going on is that you can you can see the decay, see the progression here. I have a design design temperature of 1175 going in. With decay heat, I'm at 1175. Sorry, without without decay heat, 1175.3. Um, I'm matching the um, outlet temperature on the money. Heat exchanger inlet temperature is on the money. Heat exchanger outlet temperature and vessel outlet temperature are very similar. But when I add decay heat, what am I matching? I'm, I'm matching the heat exchanger um, inlet temperature, but not the vessel but not the, not the uh, vessel outlet temperature. So that's where I had to tune the uh, heat transfer coefficient on the heat exchanger, um, raise it a little bit, I'm sorry, lower it just a little bit to bring this back up, which is what would be the design, the design value. But if you, but I don't know if you can tell, Fuel. 
this is basically the same issue. Wait a minute. I must have, I forgot the 10 to an 8 there. Um, is the engineer who designed the radiator, the molten salt reactor experiment, screwed up. He used the wrong air property tables, under designed the radiator, and they were limited to 8 megawatts thermal output. I ran a uh, case a case set at eight megawatts as well, and I apologize that I missed the uh, miss changing the the tens to an eight there. Time. As I said earlier, eleven precursor groups, and notice. They all have different half-lives. The uh, short-lived, wait a minute, I've lost my, uh, there it is. The short-lives are at the top, the longer lives are at the bottom. So as you can see, there's, a, there's an actual difference in the concentration of the short-lived precursors uh, between the core and the longer lives. Same, oh. Now for now for delayed neutrons. Precursor, and um, again with um, with a mechanical fuel core formed in the core. And they decay in the core, releasing delayed neutrons in the core. Well, with molten salt, remember, they're being formed in the fuel, which is flowing through the system. So they are formed in the core, but not all decay in the core. So I don't know if you can see this, but with uranium-235 fuel, you notice that with um, static conditions, in other words, pump off, the delayed neutron fraction in the core is actually a lot higher than the delayed, neut than the delayed neutron fraction when the pump's on. Similar situation with uranium-233. And the difference is that your shorter-lived precursors are more affected by this than the, than the longer lived, just as with the decay heat precursors. Okay, I ran three different transient sets. One of them was a start, one of them was a pump stop and coast down, and the other one was a natural circulation. We're done during zero power testing in 65 with uranium-235 fuel. Uh, the conditions, the reactor was critical. The control rods are set to move automatically to maintain the reactor critical. So in other words, reactivity goes up, rods go, rods go in, reactivity goes down, rods pull out. Um, a fuel pump is started and So what happens when you start a pump with regards to reactivity? At this point, at the beginning, with no flow, all your delayed neutron precursors are being for formed and staying in the core. All your delayed neutrons are being formed in the core. Delayed neutrons, they're being formed out in the loop. So what that does is, it removes reactivity from the core. The control rod and the control rod has to move out. Now, what was measured was, an, was a, a bit of an overshoot and then some oscillation. I get the same approximate behavior. I don't get as much of an overshoot. Um, I also don't get quite the oscillation. 
think that there was there's probably some dead banding with the uh, rod control system that um, I wasn't able to model because I have no idea what their dead band was. But I did match the final rod position. Now, in this particular case, you have a you have a you have some of your delayed neutrons being formed in in the loop or some in the loop. That's positive reactivity. The rods have to, and a rod has to. As you can see, I'm almost dead on. I'm close. This is also a, uh, a slow. The delayed neutron, uh, delayed neutrons need to catch up to a new steady state condition. They're still in transient. And, and again, final rod position is very consistent with measured data. However, something occurred to me on both of these. It wasn't exactly a good match. Remember, they have a lot more overshoot. And it hit, and it hit me. Maybe there's another reason, reason for that big overshoot. I am running reactivity. Well, first of all, rods are responding to measured to react outside, outside the vessel, outside the core, just like you would see happening in a commercial power reactor, where they have X core uh, neutron measurement or X neutrons at the periphery are going to be more important. I'm running a little. I'm short on time. Are going to be are, are going to be more more important than. The my uh, neutron reactivity, my delayed neutron reactivity that I've been here was average delayed neutron. In fact, a, a, a very different velocity out at the peripheral channel or peripheral area than in than the average, which is actually going to affect how the del the delayed neutrons behave. So I basically tied reactivity that the, that the rods are, are responding to, to the delayed neutron fraction, not the average, but the outer region of the core. And this is what we got. Now, it's not perfect. Um, uh, there, this is, there's, there's still some, I, I, I'd get a much better match. Not quite perfect, I expect. But, um, there are going to be some effects of, say, the next zone in that would smooth things out, but my model can't do that. Um, but as you can see, very, very, a much, much, much better match. Transient that I did with the natural circulation. Um, a lot of information that I, some, some good information I had, and um, well, as John was saying, sometimes there's a lot of information you don't have. Um, So, no control rod motion is on. And all is the uh, radiator door positions. Um, certainty, things like that. At each of these positions, what's the rate? Um, my. Uh, But with the doors partly down, or mostly down, a lot of tubes are, blank, are, are blocked off by that. Also, I had no idea. Um, I did a pretty good job of matching the reactor power. job of matching the system temperatures. So what are the conclusions? 
first of all. Good agreement and experimental data. The hydraulic test facility and the actual molten salt reactor, both for steady state and transient conditions. Also, tracer capabilities allow us to track radio, radio, radioactive isotopes, such as decay heat precursors and delayed neutron precursors, which uh, makes it very valuable for handling a uh, molten salt reactor. And now I'm going to turn this back over to John. Through the use of the two benchmarks for the um, uh, EBR2 uh, molten salt reactor and uh, uh, others, we've demonstrated the capability of Gothic to be used for advanced reactor designs, uh, especially of those types that are being used today, including the TWR uh, reactor from TerraPower for sodium is based on EBR2. Uh, a lot of the other advanced reactors are based on the MSRE and other uh, advances from that. Uh, so uh, it's good to agree. It's got a great BNV program. Um, that's my marketing, you know, hey, hey aren't we great? Uh, um, uh, there's a lot of simulation tools that are available. Some will do only one-dimensional like Relap 5. Some will do multi-dimensional like CFD. Uh, there's a trade-off in that range between uh, fidelity and runtime model size, how long does it take to generate your grid. Um, uh, Gothic falls in the middle between that, being able to do analysis with much larger grids, response time and analysis. Um, 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 just some of the things to some of the things to learn from any time you do a benchmark are uh, just what we said. A lot of data is not available. You have to make assumptions. Um, you can try searching the public domain. All the information is not always available. Okay? So make assumptions. Be reasonable in your assumptions. Think about what the, these guys did when they, they developed the experiments. Right? They didn't have all the data they needed either, but they put something together to try to evaluate what was going on in the various capabilities. Okay? So this is where the industry is going. There's going to be more experimental facilities. Some of them are going to be built at the labs. Some of them are going to be built by the vendors of the new reactor designs. Okay? All of those are going to need to be benchmarked. We have a tool that we're trying to use on the end user side, the utility. The vendor or the, the, the guy that actually is going to be operating the plan in the long term is going to need to know how their plan operates. Okay? They're going to make modifications to it what effects are there going to be, okay? So you guys are all going to be involved in those type of capabilities in the future, either at the lab and experimental, at the, at the university through um, uh, benchmarking and helping advance the codes like CTF, et cetera. Um, so any questions for us? Thank you. I'd like to see if we have some questions. We have any questions? Yes. Correct. Sure, 45R. This one? What happened here? What, what, what happened here? This in this test, they had the magnetic pump continued to operate, and during that test, the operator cranked up the 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 current on the electromagnetic pump, and so the 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 the, 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 the pump increased in in uh, in capability and therefore flow. No, no.
Consult.org has a lot of downloaded reports, and then there's also what was it? OST. Oh, sorry. What was it science and technical information? Um, you can actually search on that and get a lot and get tons of reports. Yes, there are some that were never scanned that aren't available uh, on the public domain, but um, there's a lot that, that, that is available. With regards to the salt that they used, they did start out with fresh salt. However, they left it in, they left the same salt in from beginning to end of the testing from 1965 to 1969. When they transitioned from uranium-235 to, to uranium-233, all they did is they, they actually used chemi used a uh, uh, some kind of fluoridation process to to uh, turn the uranium into into UF6 gaseous UF6 and remove it from the uh, and remove it from the salt, and then they added uranium-233. Now, what that does mean is that you have a lot of fission products, and that is going to affect your uh, properties. I didn't see a lot of information on that. In fact, our, uh, our properties in Gothic are basically just represent pure uh, lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride. So it doesn't, doesn't account for that. Any uh, studies, studies on that? I would imagine that somebody would probably need to do some experimentation and testing to see what the actual effects on fluid properties are. Any other um, uh, let me continue on that. Uh, it's one of the, TerraPower uh, is, does not just do the sodium traveling wave reactor. They also have a, a molten chloride reactor that they're working on as well. And, and, and that's one of their concerns as well. And um, they've asked us that question, but there's been no funding. Uh, outside their own house to, to do it because they don't have a customer right now. But um, uh, their intent is to uh, develop all their own salts uh, and have to have thermal properties, thermodynamic properties for all of the different states of. So they're going to need to have all those thermodynamic properties developed uh, for it. Um, for the duration of the transients that we run, the changes in the thermodynamic properties of the fluid isn't going to be significant to, to affect the, the thermal hydraulic response. Um, but for longer transients where you're trying to analyze long periods of time, especially if you're going to try to um, remove sample and then change the salt, there is a chance that the, thermal the thermodynamic properties would change. Um, so that makes it more difficult in a thermal hydraulics code like Relap or even SAS or Gothic or, or whatever you're going to use to analyze your core. How are you going to change properties that you read in as tables um, and change over time? Um, and so uh, uh, steps, but not implementation yet. So, okay.